But first, um, a bit about how we go from the fast cube file output we get from the sequencer. Um, we can either, uh, what is more the classical way is to have a reference genome. We map our reads to the reference genome. Then we have an annotation file uh, that tells us where the genes on the genome are. And we basically count how many reads do we have on each gene and we then get a matrix with gene level counts per cell. We can also do it at transcript level where we try to quantify different isoforms per gene, uh, which is a bit trickier and a lot noisier. Uh, and basically we can also try to assign isoforms and so on uh, without the annotation. There are also some tools uh, where you align directly to the transcriptome. Uh, quite often you would use pseudo aligners for these, uh, like Callisto, Salmon. And these pipelines have the advantage that they're fast and not so memory intense as mapping to the full genome. And also, in some projects, we basically work with non-model organisms where we only have a transcriptome of that species, and then that's the only path you can take. And then, of course, once we have transcript level counts, we can merge them into gene counts if we want to. Uh, a lot of people want to study isoforms in single cell RNA-seq, but my recommendation for like clustering and identifying <laughs> cell types at a broad level is to merge the isoforms per gene and do clustering as a first step because the data is noisy enough and then if you add another layer of multiple isoforms per gene and the uncertainty in assigning them it might get even noisier And basically there are a lot of different tools for them counting how the reads map to the annotated uh, transcriptomes. I mean, you, you might have assigned a gene onto your reference genome, depending on how the read maps. Uh, you can assign it differently And most of these tools, you would like a spliced mapper that allows for mapping half the read here and half the read here. Then you can decide on settings for uh, reads that overlap two genes, if you should discard them. Uh, if they map to multiple genes, uh, it's a multiple multi-mapping issue, uh, if you discard them or not, which is, uh, the standard thing to do. So like recently we had a discussion with someone that wants to, wanted to study transcript uh, TE elements that have multiple copies across the genome, then of course you will not get a lot of mapping on them if you start dis discarding all your multi-mapping reads. But I think these standard pipelines are very good uh, in most cases. It's only if you have very specific use cases where you want to study like splicing or like I said, specific uh, elements in the genome or something that you might need to go in and tweak these kind of settings. And then uh, a lot of these different library prep methods that are tag-based include unique molecular identifiers. And what they are, are basically uh, random barcodes that are added to either at the oligo-DT primer, or you can add them at the primer at the other end and get your barcode at the phi prime end. And if you have, first you dissociate your cells and you get these different barcodes. 
and then you do amplification. As you see here, you might get a lot of amplification of some transcripts, very little of another. But since you have a random barcode on them, you can identify them and you can count back and say, we actually had eight different molecules detected in this one and three different molecules detected in this one. So here we can remove the amplification bias. And the 10x pipeline or all these drop uh, sec based methods use these kind of UMIs together with the cell barcode, of course, then so that we can pull multiple cells also and sequence them together. Then the next issue, so the, uh, uh, these droplet-based methods, you load an uh, amount of cells with the aim of getting a certain amount of libraries, right? And most of the droplets you will have in your 10x machine will be empty because if you start filling it up too much uh, to reduce the number of empty droplets, then you will have a lot of doublets and triplets and so on in your drops. So you have to stay at a reasonable level. And what these tools do to define what they believe to be an empty droplet versus uh, a cell in the droplet is to look at these kind of curves where you rank the barcodes based on number of UMIs and the number of UMIs. I mean, all of these curves are more or less uh, similar. You find this kind of inflection point and you say anything with more than this number of uh, UMIs, I say is a cell and anything below, I say, is most likely an empty droplet. Of course, it might not look as pretty as in this example. You might have sort of multiple knees in this plot. And then you might have to go back because the output you get from Cell Ranger is one full matrix and one filtered matrix. And the filtered matrix only contains these blue ones. And the full one contains all of this. So you can use the tools uh, like droplet utils. There's functions in Serat and Scran and so on where you can plot these things yourself. You can look at the, the second knee and see what those express and try to figure out what you have in these different populations. It might be, for instance, if you have a lot of red blood cells, you might get another small knee here with, with very small cells. So let's see, I will actually show you one of these cell ranger reports. I thought it would be good to look at together. So this is just one from the 10X website. Uh, so as you see here, now it's not super clear. You could increase the, the size. Yes, I can. Like this? Yes, thanks. Um, so here, the Cell Ranger package has uh, decided that this is the level where we say we have a cell. But you see you have a bump down here, but most of them have between 10 and 50 U mice. It could be some cell debris, it could be red blood cells or uh, something else. If you're uncertain, get the full matrix, extract uh, the cells that have between, around 50 U mice and look at what genes you detect in them. That's the only way to really know what is in there. And I know we had a uh, a brief discussion on Slack where someone asked about why they filter away more than 99% of their uh, of their cells, uh, but it's actually filtering around away 99% of your barcodes because most of the barcodes will be in empty droplets. 
So all these gray ones, you see it's a logarithmic scale. So we have almost a million different barcodes, but only, uh, let's see, probably says 3,300 something uh, that are defined as cells. Some other things to look at is, of course, then the quality of mapping and so on in these reports. We want, for a good quality library, we want high mapping to the genome. And most of it mapping to the transcriptome. And then this intronic regions, as we talked about before, if you have a nuclei sample, will be quite high, probably over 50%. You should also keep in mind that what annotation you use plays a big role in what stats you get on this. If you go with ensemble full annotation, that's quite complete. You will have most of your reads mapping to the transcriptome. But if you go with RefSeq, for instance, that it doesn't include a lot of pseudogenes and uh, non-coding genes and so on, you will have a lower proportion mapping to the transcriptome. And something else that's really important to look at, I think, is sequencing saturation, which they also have as plots down here. So basically, depending on how many reads you include, how, uh, how many more new UMIs do you detect? Because if we do very few cells and sequence very deep, we will just keep on sequencing a lot of new uh, PCR duplicates, right? And then it's kind of a waste of money to sequence more. And also how many more new genes do we detect as we increase the amount of reads? Ideally, you want to get to a point where this, these two curves starts to flatten out. Uh, if you're at 30% sequencing saturation or something, it's quite easy to resequence the same libraries uh, to deep, uh, higher depth. And if you're way too high, then you know you can sequence less the next time you do this experiment and save some money. And then cell ranger also does uh, some clustering and so on. And I think it's a good idea to at least look at it. It's not a perfect analysis. They haven't done a lot of tweaking and quality control. So as you can see here, what's mainly separating, even though you probably distinguish individual cell types. Within the cell types, it's mainly just separating by number of UMIs. So it's quite likely that a lot of this stuff down here should be filtered out. But it at least gives you an idea how well your experiment worked before you start taking it to your computer and doing the analysis yourself. Okay. I will go back to my, unless you have any questions on the report, I will go back to my presentation. And as I said, there are multiple different pipelines you can use. Uh, and yeah, th this is just some stats from different, they, they compare different library prep methods and different mapping pipelines and different annotation files. You will get dif differences in number of detected genes in, uh, and so on. But I think the main thing to think about is as long as everything you're comparing is done with the same pipeline, the results will be comparable between cells. I think the issue is when you start downloading a lot of data from online and public data sets you want to compare with, you should check what pipeline they used 
it might be a good idea if they use a completely different way of mapping and so on, then you should probably download their raw data and run the pipeline yourself the same way so that you don't introduce an additional bias when you're uh, comparing data. Otherwise, uh, I think the, all of these pipelines work fine. You might have small differences between them. <laughs>